Hello and welcome to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast. I'm Moray Gamble. Join me each week in conversation with leading ecological thinkers, activists, authors, designers, and practitioners to explore what now, what is the kind of thinking we need to navigate a positive and regenerative way forward, to myceliate possibilities, to explore what a thriving one planet way of life could look like. My guests offer voices of clarity and common sense. In this episode of Sense Making the Changing World, I'm speaking with the one and only Charlie McGee, permaculture creative, educator, award-winning songwriter extraordinaire, a genius of sharing permaculture with the world through his music, both as a solo artist and with his band, The Formidable Vegetable Sound System. What one person can do with a ukulele and some pretty awesome beats is just amazing. This is Music With Purpose. Charlie and I caught up recently in my lounge room to talk about his latest album, Microbiome. You can find the link here down in the show notes. Charlie is an avid permaculture practivist, myceliating permaculture wherever he goes. He's also on the board of Permaculture Australia and leads Grow Do It with permaculture educator, illustrator and activist Brenna Quinlan, inspiring future generations with the ethics of earth care, people care and fair share. As well as performing at major music festivals around the world, Charlie has collaborated with amazing musicians. Check out his fantastic TEDx talk and follow along on social media as he and Brenna build a cool hempcrete house in a Western Australian community. The Sense Making and Changing World podcast is a project of the Permaculture Education Institute. We teach permaculture design, teaching and livelihood skills online to people on six continents who in turn localise and enrich it and find appropriate ways to apply the planet care ethics of earth care, people care and fair share wherever they are. I'm recording this episode from my hand-built solar-powered studio here on beautiful Gubby Gubby country, surrounded by my permaculture design gardens in a permaculture village. Before we jump in, I'd love to invite you to subscribe to the Sense Making a Changing World podcast on your favourite podcast app, and please do leave us a five-star review and a lovely comment. It does indeed help the bots to find our show. I hope you enjoy this episode. Well, thank you, Charlie, for joining me on the show today. It's like... Last time we spoke, I think we were talking with the Perma Youth and we did a masterclass about creatives and finally here you are. In you real life. To... I know, that doesn't happen. That often, I know. Does it? Yeah, well, thank you for joining me on the show. I Tonight you've got a gig happening here and you're actually travelling around the countryside all over the place, um, releasing, launching your new album, Microbiome. Yeah, it's been a amazing trip we're just doing slow travel so we're yeah. traveling down the coast and visiting all these amazing permaculture places and communities and elders and people in the movement and it's just such good perspective building yeah and then you know passing on the stories that you hear onto the next community and yeah kind of like being a little bit of that myceliation yeah. going on it's awesome it's my jam <laughs> <laughs> so i wanted to begin by asking you a little bit around just going back into the permaculture world of that's the kind of the essence of what it is that you're doing but what does it mean to you like i'm not asking you for a definition but what has permaculture meant to your life like how has it shifted and changed and framed your world well it's interesting because i think i think i'm maybe bordering on a second generation permi my dad introduced me to it through just having all of Bill Mollison's books, you know, the designer's manual and permaculture one and, and two sitting around on coffee tables when I was a kid. And, and, and I grew up on an off-grid permaculture property, you could call it, although dad was full-time teaching and, and didn't have a lot of time to, you know, go really deep into it. But we had veggie gardens and composting toilets and chickens and no power or TV or anything like that. So I was just left to my own devices as a kid to entertain myself. And, um, you know, I suppose like a lot of kids around here, you have to make up your own fun. And a lot of that was exploring outside and, and getting involved in, you know, the chickens and, and the garden. And I didn't have a sense of what permaculture was, but I, I remember flicking through this book, you know, on, on the coffee table one day, and it was, it was Permaculture One. And just looking at the pictures, because I, you know, couldn't be bothered reading all the text, I was like, oh, but this stuff looks cool. It's like I was right into chickens. And there was these pictures of these cool chicken yards with lots of doors going into different gardens. I was like, Dad, what's that about? And he kind of explained the concept. I was like, wow, that sounds cool. <laughs> and then <clears throat> later on, um, when I moved to the city, it was only then that I kind of realised that my life wasn't normal <laughs> and that I, I might be a bit weird compared to the majority of, you know, the first world <laughs> that I lived in. But... Um, yeah, that, it was only then that I kind of started realising that, oh, wow, we've got some big systemic 
problems in the world and I've in a way been sheltered from them a lot of my life although growing up down south I was in the southwest of WA and in the 90s there was a huge old growth forest logging protests and I was in uh, you know a kid in the middle of that but I saw the community just fracture and divide mostly to the side of the loggers because that was where they lived and worked but at the same time you know there were there were a few enviros and greenies around and they were just like we've got to save the forest so there was this huge divisive you know thing happening and, and forest blockades and and timber workers coming down to try and you know threaten the the greenies up in the trees and i was just like what is this all about like this you know and, and at school you know most of the kids were were, were mill workers kids and so they'd they'd put up signs at home saying no greenies allowed and stuff like that and i'll be like oh but but i'm a greenie <laughs> i thought that was a good thing <laughs> so you know i definitely did have a sense that i wasn't quite you know one of the crowd even in that <laughs> scenario <laughs> but um yeah it, it was sort of a slow process um i guess as to what permaculture means to me now it's it's really just it's my community it, and it's a global community and an, and, a, and an extended movement that through, you know, extreme privilege of being a musician and a, and a traveller, I can just kind of rock up and, and, and fit in, you know, which I'd never experienced growing <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, you're right, isn't it? It is this, it's a global language, it's a global community and you feel at home when you land with people who kind of get where you're coming from. Mm. And it's really beautiful. Um, so where did you actually then learn what permaculture is about? Because I'm noticing this with my kids too. They're kind of growing up in amongst all of this and they use the, you know, the compost loo and the, the solar-powered house. And all take the it rain. all for granted. And it is. It's just like, well, this is just, just is. And then, and, but it wasn't until I, they did a PDC with me when we were in, in East Africa. They went, oh, that's what we're doing. Yeah. And I wonder for you, like where, you know, apart from reading the books, did you actually go and learn somewhere to really understand what permaculture is or it was just been this lifelong journey? No, I was actually not aware of it at all before I did my PDC. And I, I did it with Robin Francis mm. in New South Wales. But before that, I actually kind of, I kind of rejected it a bit. You know, it was, it was sort of like daggy dad stuff. <laughs> And even though I love chickens and, you know, I love being outside and making cubbies and stuff, it was like whenever he tried to get me to help in the garden, I'd be like, no, nah, I just want to go and be on the computer, you know. I was like a, I was an early nerd. And, um, you know, that entailed, like, starting the generator to run the computer and turn on the cranking old 32K modem and, like, you know, I could be on there for half an hour but with burning fuel, to, you know. Like, I didn't, I didn't really make the connection. <coughs> but, um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, when I moved to the city, I was like, oh, Hang on, the, the world needs some solutions, and mm -hmm. and that whole thing of you like you know in a, in a crisis, um, people people use whatever's lying around, mm -hmm. and I guess for me permaculture was lying around, and I was like, oh, I remember something that this, this permaculture thing, and I'd heard a few friends kind of mentioning it because they were starting to get into it, and I um I decided to, to enrol in a course, and so yeah, I went to Robin Francis. I, I looked up a whole lot of different courses, and there was so many different kinds of permaculture I didn't realize it was such a broad thing mm. and um you know I still kind of had this illusion in my mind that it was all about gardening and that was blown out of the water pretty quickly <laughs> by Robin but you know I looked into earthworks courses and sort of big you know broad acre design and do lots of swales and do the whole you know that kind of thing but the thing that drew me to Robin's course was that she had this real grounding in I guess her own history and roots and, and this sort of pagan mm. element that, mm. that she connected with um, her, her current context, which was living on Bundjalung country in northern New South Wales. And, and the way she'd set up the teaching uh, centre was by, you know, consulting local elders and saying, hey, what's, what's this country about? And they're like, well, tell us, what, what's your story? What's your country? And she's like, I have no idea. And so she looked into it and, and, and sort of dove into her own cultural heritage and then had this beautiful meeting of the two so she called it Janbung Gardens which is relates to the platypus in that culture but then yeah she, she sort of wove in this this shared history I suppose of um, a lot of you know ancient practices from from my ancestors as well mm -hmm. but also from the local you know people of, of that country and I just I really resonated with that because before I, I lived in the southwest of WA um, I actually grew up in remote Indigenous communities in Northern Territory where my parents were working 
in the school and, and uh, clinic. But some of my earliest memories are just hanging out with the local kids and roaming the community. And, and it was like a free-for-all, you know. As a kid, it was like paradise because yeah. you could just go walking with your mates, you know, two and three years old we were, and just wandering the, the town and every, anyone, everyone was looking out for us. And we'd go in and, like, anyone would feed us or take care of us and then when my parents came looking, they'd be like, hey, where's Charlie? They'd be like, oh, he's with that mob down there. So, you know, it was, it was just this really tight, grounded sense of community from like a really young age. Yeah. And then something about Robin's course kind of just triggered something in me that was like, oh, this is, this is for me. Mm. And uh, she's also a musician. So I was like, I was coming from that world as well. I'd been yeah. playing in bands for about 10 years and, and just not really... What, not really knowing what the point of it was of like, oh, music's really fun, but what am I actually Why? doing for the yeah. world? Yeah, what's yeah. the purpose? And so I kind of threw it aside. I was like, I'm going to do this permaculture stuff and music's just, yeah, well, whatever, that's just for fun. <laughs> but, um, but she actually combined the two, which was the, the seed of what yeah. I did next. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I see the work that you're doing as such an important part of sharing out this perspective into the world in terms of, sharing out the possibilities that there are for a different kind of future and through singing it and through the you know through the your collaborations with Brenner and you know shifting culture so what is it about permaculture that you think we can share out really widely and will land and actually create the change that we need I mean what's your theory of of change and it's a big question, I know. Sorry, Charlie, but... <laughs> no, I, I like it. I think, I think fun is where I come, come to it from. You know, that, who was it that, that said, I don't want to join your revolution if I can't dance? Um, oh, I wish I was good with quotes. But anyway, that, that's totally where I'm at with it. Because, you know, there's a lot of heavy stuff and there's a lot of big problems and, and wicked problems in the world and there's a lot of serious people working on serious things and doing great work. But then the other side of that is I see a lot of activists and, you know, environmentalists get burnt out and totally just... And even people working in, you know, in big government or corporate, like everyone's kind of just in the grind and it's like a big job. Yeah. And, you know, that's all really important, but we need to keep a sense of of fun and enjoyment as well yeah. and, and solidarity, I suppose, because it can you can feel quite alone sometimes mm -hmm. doing this work. And I went through a lot of that when I first did my PDC, my permaculture design course with Robin, um, because the first few days is the whole evidence to act and, mm -hmm. and wicked problems and what's wrong with the world. And so after the second day or whatever, like, I was just oh. in this pit of despair, <laughs> like, oh, God, get me off. Like, somebody stop. <laughs> I want to get off the world. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I just was kind of, I went to my housemate who was also doing the course with me at the time and, and said, oh, what do I do? You know, what? I'm just one person. What are, what are we doing? How's this going to change the world? Yeah. And then um, she said uh, another quote from Howard Thurman. I remembered that one, <laughs> which was, don't ask yourself, what can I do for the world? Ask what makes me come alive? Because what the world needs is people who've come alive. And that just made so much sense yeah. to me. I was like, oh wait, you mean the thing that I love doing, which is playing music, I mean, music makes me come alive. You mean I can do something with that? Yes. And I was, it was almost too good to be true. I'm like, but, but it's not hard work. It's not serious. It's, it's just fun, you know? But, but then something started to shift and I was like, wait, maybe I can have fun and do work for the world, yeah. you know, making the world a better place. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's, that's from, from what we've done since, you know, with the band and, and, and our music, you know, I, I really see that, that it does bring other people alive and it gets people out of that, you know, maybe despairing or, mm. or overworked, burnt out place to just somewhere where they can get a bit loose and, and yep. feel, you know, happy again, but then come back to the purpose, which is throughout all of the, the music yep. that I write and then feel empowered to do something. So, and I think, you yeah. know, there's something about when you're in that state of being relaxed, somehow you kind of let, let go of the stiffness of your life and the doors open to new ideas and, and new possibilities. And when your lyrics kind of hit in and you start to hear them, and they, kind of, they land and they help people to make sense of, of 
the bigger picture and brings it into this beautiful, accessible. Like I hear Monty going around singing your songs all the time. You know, they're, <laughs> they're earworms, aren't they? And you, yep. it gets in, yeah. and and it. So opening the doors of possible change through something that brings people together. And I love the way too that you, you know, you'll do house concerts as much as you, you know, go to oh, big it. festivals. And yeah. So it's coming in places that create the we. So that shift from the me to the we, which I think too is part of this shift in permaculture yeah. from being just about gardening to being about, you know, bringing whole people systems. together to create whole systems change. So tell us a bit about your evolution of your music because you, you went to this PDC and then like, how did you all of a sudden become this global <laughs> permaculture music phenomenon oh, from, from a PDC? Look, your guess is as good as mine. It was, it was <laughs> all, I mean, it's, 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 I'd say there's some design element to it, but a lot of serendipity and luck as well. And it... <clears throat> It was really quite amazing how it all happened. I, um, I didn't even want to write <laughs> the first song about permaculture. I was, we were doing Robin's course and, and she played us some of her music, you know, from her, her band, uh, you know, the Green Gorilla Gang, all about, you know, gorilla gardening around, <laughs> around the Northern Rivers. And, and we watched that and thought it was pretty cool. And I was like, oh, you know, wouldn't it be cool if there was a permaculture band? But I didn't think that, like, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> and my housemate, again bless her, said, hey, you should write a song about permaculture on your ukulele. And I just went, no, 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 I, 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 no, I don't, that's the daggiest idea anyone's ever had. Because <laughs> I was just picturing like, I don't know, the 70s, like hug a tree and kumbaya yeah, and yeah. all this kind of, you know, nerdy stuff. But she was like, no, you can do a really good job at it, do it. And she was, she was making us dinner that night. She said, you're not getting your dinner until you've written a verse and a chorus. I was like, damn, that's, you know. That's Good not a to motivation. Have like that, isn't I it? know. Yep, yeah. she's definitely one of those very yeah. influential friends. Yeah. And so I did. I, I knuckled down and I wrote the first verse and chorus for for our song "No Such Thing as Waste," mm. which was just you know. Oh, that was the first. That one? That was the first one, oh, wow. and it was actually for part of a, a class presentation that we had to oh. give. So Robin had asked us to come and present yeah. a permaculture principle, and uh, and so I just was like, all right, fine, I'll pick the easiest one. All right, produce no waste. Yeah, yes. I'll just write a recycling song, whatever. <laughs> But I got into it and I was like, oh, I can actually relate to, you know, things growing up and living in a mud brick shack made of recycled timber yeah. and driving a veg oil van. And, yeah. and so I wrote all that into the song and I played it to the class and it was just like, oh, this is so humiliating. <laughs> and they all loved it. And I was like, what's wrong with you people? This is daggy, right? You're supposed to hate me. And they said, no, play it again. <laughs> and, then, and then again and again. And they, and they eventually asked, they, someone said, hey, you should write a song for, each, for every permaculture yeah. principle. And I was like. Well, why not? It's just crazy <laughs> enough to work. So I spent the next 12 months writing and releasing one song a month mm -hmm. on YouTube. And this is back when you could actually, you know, <laughs> make a difference on YouTube. <laughs> it wasn't as noisy as it is now. Oh, no, it's massive. Isn't but, um, you know, it started to build a following and people that I had no idea who they were were mm -hmm. commenting and saying, oh, this is great, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to share this with my permaculture courses or my, my students or community or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. It's helping people. And, and I didn't know what to do with it. And it was only when a friend <coughs> who had a recording studio suggested that I just come over and record some songs that I went, oh, okay, yeah, I could do that. Record my own EP. Hey, yes. that's a cool idea. <laughs> and we started laying down the songs. And then, and then he put some drums to them. And then I, I called up some other friends who put some other bits to them. And then I, then I just had this moment one day where I was like, what would my dream band be? And I, I was, I don't know, I think I'd had a coffee or something. So I was super uh, enthusiastic. And I emailed all of my dream musicians and said, hey, I'm writing this album about permaculture. Do you want to play on it? And I didn't expect to hear anything back. But one, one of the players that I really admired, Mal Webb, mm -hmm. got back to me and said, hey, great songs. Yeah, I'll play some trumpet on them. I was like, oh my God, Mal Webb's going to play on my album. And I've been a fan of his for 10 years. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I couldn't imagine him, you know, getting back to me and then he sends back his 10 piece horn orchestra and and you know all these amazing trumpet and trombone parts on these songs and they just sounded incredible oh, I was like oh my god <laughs> so suddenly we had this big sound yeah. and you know I, I produced the album and got it mixed and mastered and I was like right well now I've got this awesome album but I don't have a band you know I've just got all these random musos that have played on it and and I don't know what to do with it like maybe people teaching courses would be interested or something um, but I was in another band at the time called Ensemble Formidable and they were a 10 piece electro swing orchestra and had just been booked to play at this international 
dance festival up in Cairns for the solar eclipse in 2012. And we're all really excited. We're like, yes, the solar eclipse, big international festival, people from all over the world, this will be great. And uh, I wanted to get there early so I could experience the festival. So I rocked up and the rest of the band had other commitments so they couldn't arrive until the day we were playing. But I found out when I arrived from the organiser that they put us on a different day than they told us. Oh, no. And they said, okay, so you're ready to go on the first night on the main stage at 10 o'clock. I was like, hang on, you told us we're on the second night. The band's not going to be here. They're coming from Perth. He's like, oh, can you change your travel? It's like, no. (laughs) Do you want to pay another six grand to change flights and stuff? He's like, well, what are we going to do on the first night? And I just thought off the top of my head, I said, well, I've got a ukulele and some songs about permaculture. I could do that. He goes, yep, great, do that. I was like, oh, crap. (laughs) Then I had, like, I just landed myself a spontaneous gig on the main stage of an international (laughs) dance music festival (laughs) with just me and some songs about permaculture. And I was like, oh, God, how am I going to pull this off? So I had a friend who was a DJ help me put together some electronic beats that could pass as dance music (laughs) and ran around the campsite plucking musicians out of their tents and be like, you, can you play with me tonight? Meet me at eight. No time to explain. And they're like, (laughs) okay. I was like... Neighbourhood of E minor. <laughs> we all got on stage at like, oh I don't know, 9pm with yeah. this crowd on the first night just frothing to go. Oh. And, then, and then as we were getting on stage, the MC said, what are you called? And I just blurted out, formidable vegetable sound system. And that's what they announced us as. And that so stuck for a it, it stuck. After we got off stage... We got invited to play at Glastonbury, at uh, oh Burning Man, <laughs> Shambhala, like a world tour just landed oh, on, wow. on our laps. And, um, Holy moly. Yeah, it was just an explosive moment. Wow. Oh, that's an incredible <laughs> story. My gosh. That's that emergent process, isn't it, when you're yeah. just fully in the zone. Couldn't have planned that. No, no. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's amazing. And so now like, you hear what, that's 11 years on, yeah, and you're releasing another album. So, what's tell us more about what's going on with this? So, that was the permaculture principles. That was, yep, the concept album. Yep, and um, I mean, from the beginning, I'd, I'd always planned to make it accessible for kids. I thought, oh, oh you know, who's yeah. who's the most likely audience for this? And I thought, oh, kids would surely dig it, and I could yep. maybe get it into schools and give this to teachers. But yep. after we after we did the festival. We, we inadvertently just found ourselves, you know, swept away in this raver dance music psychedelic festival scene for like seven years. And we're like, what is this? Like, this is not where, where I expected we'd go. I remember meeting you at Woodford years and years and years ago in the Children's Festival when you were saying, oh, I'm going to go and start doing some children's education with permaculture. And, and um, yeah, so then that, that must have been around about that time yeah. before that world touring happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well. I, I, it always stayed with me because I, I was like, well, these, these doofers are interesting, but I think, you know, they don't necessarily listen as well as kids do. So I, I always wanted to come back to that educational yeah. side because that yeah. was the point. So we started writing a few, you know, kid-friendly tracks. Mm. But because we then had a really great electronic producer, they turned into these electronic dance tracks and we still, you know, the doofers still loved it. So <laughs> <laughs> then a lot of the doofers grew up and had kids. So that was perfect. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So now we get these, you know. She got next gen already. Next yeah, gen we get goers. these ex raver party goers coming with their kids, being like, yeah. "Oh, you know, play songs for perma- about permaculture for our kids." <laughs> and so, yeah, now now we've got the new album, which is um, sort of like a kids doof dance jazz funk swing album, yeah, right. all about the microbiome. Because, mm. um, yeah, I, I've just I guess even even tra- tracking tracking the arc of the band, you know, it went from this really small fringy idea and then exploded and went to the world stage in you know 2.5 seconds and I was like whoa what's going on and for a while I was sort of I got sucked into that you know sort of rock star dream of like let's get bigger and bigger and mainstream and get a label and tour the world and bigger festivals and and then after a while I just realized that just like everything with that sort of mindset it wasn't sustainable and it wasn't sustainable for me and it wasn't sustainable for for the band so I started to kind of degrow the band, mm. and in 2019, um, actually stopped flying altogether, and cancelled Glastonbury, which we'd been booked wow. for again, uh, and an entire world tour um, because you know the IPCC report had just come out. Oh, it was yeah. like climate's getting real. I can't yeah. be preaching climate action and flying all over the world mm. every five minutes. It was mm. like the irony just crept up on me, and so I just sort of set in motion this this 
degrowth model, which we're still doing now, but it's sort of it's leveled out now, and uh, and it's it's kind of crept into the music, which is which I like. So the new album's all about just appreciating the small things, yeah. and and you know the soil food web, and the gut biota, and the microbes, and yeah. and the the little people in communities doing amazing things. Yep. And um, yeah, so it's been a bit of a bit of a natural progression, but yeah, it's been going so well. So how how yeah. do we negotiate this question? I know we were chatting about this the other day as well because we're intensely aware of the impact that we're having on the planet when we're going out and about into the world. But at the same time, people like you need to be out in the world sharing these these music, bringing people together, being the myceliation you know, sharing the stories from place to place, getting people to come together in places. So, you know, how do we how do we negotiate those just conflicts of interest all the time in this deep awareness and pain of seeing what's going on in the world? How do you negotiate your eco grief and mm. and uh, contradictions? Yeah, well, they're they're, they're constant. <laughs> I mean, I think for anyone, that, mm. you know, who's kind of aware of what's going on and, and where they're at there's no easy there's no there's no righteous way to live like mm -hmm. we're all flawed we're all going to make mistakes we're all going to try and do the right thing and do the wrong thing and we're all going to do a little bit of the right thing and a little bit of the wrong thing and for me something that really helped was doing a holistic context mm -hmm. which was inspired by the work of Dan Palmer and um you know that just kind of it's, it's like a permaculture design for, for your life, which, mm -hmm. you know, you set out your own ethics and principles and guiding um, values and then just align all of your activities and actions with that. Yep. And so, you know, when I stopped flying, I was, I was at a point where I needed to stop flying. I was, mm -hmm. I'd been on the road or, you know, travelling traveling around the world for seven years without staying in the same bed for more than three days. Oh, my gosh. Like, I was exhausted. Yeah, yeah. And I'd wake up, you know, and not know which hemisphere I was in kind of thing. <laughs> it was just like, right, well, this isn't personally sustainable. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely not ecologically sustainable. And the shows we were doing were great, but I realised I could probably do the same level of shows mostly at home. You know, yeah. obviously I can't do a Glastonbury, but I can do a Woodford, yeah. which isn't as far. Yeah. And um, so actually... I made a big pivot and um, we went from flying to traveling in a waste vegetable oil powered fire truck that I'd converted into a house with a fold down deck and a PA and, and doing like festivals and then little house concerts in between. Oh, nice. So we'd actually, we managed to do just as many gigs yeah. on, you know, fueled by waste and it just felt so much, it felt like it's just stepping into my integrity, you know, yeah. more as, as, a, as a permaculturist, I guess, or someone who sings about these yeah. lofty uh, ideals. And I could show, you know, I could show people like, well, this is one way to do it. Here's an example. Like, yeah. this is how to walk the walk instead of just talk yeah. the talk. And I've since stopped being so hard line because I did, I did say no to some really massive opportunities that I <laughs> wish I hadn't. Mm. And, uh, you know, the last couple of years, I just realised, like, if I keep doing that, I'm actually going to kind of degrow myself out of a job <laughs> so I, I, I thought I've moved more into a steady state uh, yeah, right. flow now yeah. where you know I'll, I'll you weigh everything have up. roots as well now yeah. too well that's it the, the good yeah. thing that came out of that is that I found a home and mm. I found a place to have a stable base mm. and a partner and a, yeah. a life outside of touring because I was very like ungrounded before and just there was no time to meet anybody or have yeah. a decent relationship or, or let alone have a garden yeah so now it's just like oh the balance is starting to appear yeah and it's, it's really nice. Like, it doesn't feel like, overall, like, in, in a macro sort of lens, it doesn't feel like I've strayed hugely from my ideals or principles, mm -hmm. but it was just part of the process. Yeah. You know, it's just like, go big and get out there and then come home and put the roots down and then sort of, like, it's a cycle, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And I, so. I think it's really important, too, to, to, to value those. Like, all of those things, too, were that stage that you were at, grew your experience and your reputation so that you can come home and grow your roots and still be out in the world with all those relationships that you've you've cultivated. Mm. So I think that's that's extraordinary what you've done. Oh. And um yeah. And I also think that it's really wonderful to look at how permaculture education can be so many different things. You know, often you know when you talk about oh well, I'm I'm going to be a permaculture teacher, you sort of think about standing in front of a class, but you know, it can be so many things. And I, and I think the, the young people in the refugee 
settlements who we work with really closely, the Perma Youth, have been really inspired by the permaculture music as well. And they're setting up these little studios in their camps and starting to write permaculture music. And it's, awesome. you know, that's they realise that that's kind of an important way of sharing out and attracting people to it rather than just going and telling, but it's inviting so the, the permaculture music is extraordinary. Have you come across other permi musos on your? Yeah, there's a few. There's, there's, you know, there's a growing movement for, you know, want of a better pun. But um, yeah, in the UK, there's there's quite a few. There's uh, there's the May Project Gardens, you know, permaculture hip hop. There's uh, Rack with his permaculture reggae. There's in the states, um, yeah, I came across a few people, but not so many like touring bands. Mm. I suppose there's a lot of kind of duos and and solo performers but um i mean i think it's it's creeping in more into um into more mainstream mm. bands as well like definitely the the climate action and the sort of protest songs and like presenting the issues but but something that i that i hope for is that there's more solutions based music yeah, yeah. and you know like you say like education through music it's such a i mean it shouldn't be but it's such a niche thing like mm. there's there's so much opportunity there to teach and learn through music and and a lot of cultures around the world have done that for thousands of years yeah it's kind of pretty normal for <laughs> yeah but the fact is you know like not not everyone's got an academic mind or or, or the time or you know the the resources to go to school or to university or to even a permaculture course and yeah. so to have something that's so accessible that you know an, an audio auditory learner or a visual learner can just look or hear something and then learn yeah. i think it's just it's something that should be a basic skill for, yeah. for anyone. It doesn't have to be good. You don't have to be a good musician. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a hack on the ukulele, but I just kind of come up with three chords and then yeah. sing some stuff about permaculture. It's like, <laughs> get it out there, you know, any, any way possible. So how do, you, like, how do you write your music? I mean, I, I speak with a lot of permaculture authors and, you know, they walked me through how they actually go through their process of writing. What's your process of writing a song? Does it just kind of like land or do you write your, write your lyrics first or how does it all come together? Well, it was interesting. The first album was very different. It was a very different process to, to the recent ones. But I, for that, I actually I was reading David Holmgren's book, um, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability, and highlighting every section <laughs> that could possibly be a lyric. Oh, wow. and, and that was a challenge because yeah. his writing is very dense. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, right, how do I turn this into a simple rhyme? But I'd, I'd take key words and phrases and then literally just get my, my voice recorder out and, and sing, you know, freestyle rhymes to these phrases, like the edge is where it's at or something. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then just make piles and piles of verbal compost and then slowly break it down into something um, tangible. And at the same time, you know, I've always, I've always been carrying a ukulele and just sort of tinkling along and wherever I go, I'm usually walking around playing some chords. So I'd, I had all these little riffs that I'd written over, over the years and recorded them as well. And I sort of put them together. I was like, picked a riff. I was like, oh, that sounds good. I'll sing over the top of that. Oh, nice. So I put it on a loop and I just sing some stuff. And then it, most of it was terrible, but you know, 5% of it was, was usable and then slowly whittled it down. The best songwriting advice I ever got, by the way, was from a guy called Pat Patterson who taught people like Gillian Welch how to write songs. Mm -hmm. Like he's from the States and he's a famous songwriting teacher. And uh, he came out to Perth and was doing a course. And I remember once uh, in his course, he said, when you're writing a song, don't be afraid to write crap because crap is the best fertilizer. <laughs> and with enough crap, you'll grow something beautiful. And I was like, I don't know if this guy's a permie or not, but he speaks my language. Yeah. So I always remember that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just write crap. Yeah. Well, actually, it's interesting because a lot of the a lot of the writers that I've they haven't described it like that. I really like that. <laughs> but you know, just saying, just start, just start writing every day. Just write, and you might you'll throw away most of it, but there'll be a gem that you'll see in that that'll spark off something and just keep going. Yeah. How do you how do you how do you construct an album? Like, how do you how do you construct your arc of an album? Do you actually go, okay, I'm going to focus on this one thing, or just a whole collection of different stories that you want to bring together? Like, how did you come up with the idea of microbiome as being the album? Yeah, well, that's that's an interesting question because again, it's different every project. You know, the first album was easy; it was just like, all right, chapter to chapter, that's a book done. <laughs> that was the easiest album there was to write. But but since then, I've kind of I don't know. I've just come up with ideas and written little songs and then tried to sort of fit them into a theme. I've sort of put them together and be like, oh, what's the overall theme here? And so, 
yeah, this this latest one, you know, Brent and I made a rap about the soil food web, and then I had a song about uh, less is more, and you know, appreciating the small things, and then and then a love song to the microbiome, which became the title track. And I sort of just looked at them all. I was like, oh, you know, microbes, gut flora, you know, small things. Oh, I'll just call it microbiome. And yeah, the theme sort of emerges, I guess. But I'm a I'm a fan of of the concept album. I've got to admit, I like I like listening to something from start to finish and 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 hearing the thread that weaves through you know like the classic you know, Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon sort of vibe or yep. or any of those sort of things but it's it's kind of unfortunate that that's that format has kind of been lost a bit yeah, with is. with Spotify and mm-hmm. streaming and you know especially kids you know they listen to one thing and they skip to the next thing or they or they just play one thing over and over and over and over and over yeah. I was trying to explain to my kids the other day about tapes Oh. I have no idea about, you know, you put the tape in and it's like, you just play it to the whole thing and you had to actually fast forward it through, you just didn't bother. Yeah, you know. or even CDs now. Oh, They're like, what's true. a CD? Yeah. <laughs> They're on the way out. But yeah, I'm still a big fan of the album yeah, and yeah. I'd like to create more concept albums. But really, yeah, in order to sustain a, a viable, you know, music business, mm. it's almost just like putting out singles as the thing to do oh, now. Oh, wow, okay. Which is kind of, you know, not as so, exciting. In terms of um, your focus on, like, I know that you're deeply passionate about climate action and, you know, protecting the planet, restoring the planet. How do you, when you're on stage, make sure that people get it, what you're actually trying to share? Do you do a lot of bits in between or you... Like, or is it just you hope that people will get it? Like, what's how do you help create this link between the songs and this big picture that we want to address? Yeah, I, I basically just say the same thing in different ways over and over again, which is basically that everything's connected and make sure, you know, you're doing the right thing by the planet. Yeah. But, you know, or, or any other variation of that mm-hmm. sentiment. But then it's, it's good because the songs tend to speak for themselves in a way. But the other thing to remember is that you can never, you can never make people learn mm-hmm. something or you can never know the outcome of what people are going to get out of it. Someone might be coming at it from a totally different experience or, or life you know, than me and have, have this completely random take on it that, that leads to something amazing. Yeah. And that's exactly what led me to write a song about permaculture. It's like taking two completely unrelated things and turning it into a metaphor. So if, if I can inspire that, I mean, yeah. that's great. Yeah. But obviously... You know, my intention is to to instill like a sense of what permaculture is for a start. I mean, I, I often say I'm just an unashamed marketing machine for permaculture because I'm always <laughs> like permaculture, 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 and people in the beginning were like permaculture, what's that? And yeah. now they're like, oh yeah, permaculture, we know what yeah, that is. Yeah. So that's been cool. And then these, you know, like a sense of the ethics and and mm-hmm. some of the principles, um, but, but basically just this, just finding out what a core message is and then weaving that through a set. So I'll, I'll structure the songs so that they. They're sort of related and I can sort of tell a bit of a story through it. And recently, you know, I've been really focusing more on on reconciliation and like First Nations, you know, decolonisation and, and land back and what that means because I think that ties in so closely with permaculture. I mean, permaculture literally means permanent culture mm. and to not recognise the permanent culture that yep. wants as close to permanent as any culture on earth mm. is on this very country. Mm. You know, it just seems like such an obvious connection but but that that connection is not always made mm. so i've been really focusing in on that and um you know to build in that that people care element as well which is so so important so yeah that, that changes over time but have you done any collaborative gigs with first nations now yeah so a few years ago uh we went on this awesome tour through the gascoin uh called creality in western australia and we went out to all kinds of places, like up the west coast and out to these remote communities like Burungurra, which is the second largest monocline next to Uluru that nobody really knows about, which is great. But um, yeah, we toured with this uh, awesome band from the Kimberley called Family Shoveler Band. And they're, they're a mob from Bidjidanga. And they're all family, so they're um, two brothers and a sister and the dad who started it. And uh, yeah, they were on this tour and we kind of started collaborating and then eventually over, over six weeks of this tour, we all just sort of joined forces oh, nice. and we were playing in each other's bands and stuff. Yeah, and then last year, um, we collaborated on a song which was loosely tied in with the, uh, the UN's FAO Indigenous mm-hmm. Peoples Program about 
um, indigenous food systems. Mm. And they'd, they, they'd kind of, I, I got in touch with the, the, the FAO years ago when I was writing the song about soil that I sent to them and they said, well, can this be the official UN song about soil? I was like, okay, <laughs> And <laughs> sure. they did that? Yeah. Oh, wow, my gosh, and, that's um, amazing. So they asked me, they said, oh, can you write a song about indigenous food systems? I was like, no, I can't, but <laughs> I'll ask an indigenous person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, yeah, our mates up in, uh, from Bijadanga, family shoveler band, said, oh, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, we've got heaps of stories about food. And so they wrote this beautiful song. We, we kind of collaborated. I wrote a little bit of a verse and a chorus, and then they wrote another bit and then another chorus. And they tied it all together with this story that, that their grandmother had told them about their great-great-great-great-grandmother who'd walked from Broome to Bijidanga harvesting food and you know following the seasons and, and getting all the bush tucker. And they actually had a recording of their grandmother singing the song in oh. language that their, their great, great, that their ancestor had sung oh, as she walked. Yeah. And that was what turned into the chorus. And it was just this beautiful, oh, like powerful yeah, yeah. song that emerged all about food of the country. Mm. And um, yeah, it was a really, really great project. And the song just turned out to rock and it went really well. They got on Triple J, they got, you know, number one in the independent charts. And it was just like... And it was a UN song about... Yeah, and the, the UN yeah. even offered to fly them to Rome, but they were like, oh, hang on, no, no, we, come on, we're from Bidjadega. We, we, we can't just go to Rome, like, just, just steady on. <laughs> So, you know, baby steps. Yeah. But. Oh, that's fantastic. I think, yeah. So just coming home feels like coming home on, onto country and feeling like this, the possibilities of being the change that we need to see in the world doesn't have to be about being out in the world, does it? It can be just right, being right here and doing it really well. And, and this idea of this myceliation to me just makes so much sense because... If we are in these sort of micro communities doing it really well, but we share those stories and connect those stories, that's where the transformation is is really going to happen, isn't mm. it? I mean, I feel really strongly about that that shifting shifting the power into into the this underground network of people that are flying below the radar of what's in the normal media is mm. where the change is is happening. Yeah, and and I yeah. So what what's your big picture of what you want to do in the next little while or what kind of change you want to help affect? Oh, pretty much that, I think. Like, mm. we, Brenna and I are living on an intentional community in WA now and it's a permaculture community, which is pretty awesome, and building a straw bale house and trying to just set down a, a few roots there. But we also love getting out and sharing, you know, our skills and our knowledge and, you know, connecting with the permaculture movement. So it just feels really good, like a really nice balance mm. and... I think from this trip, you know, coming over to the East Coast and heading down and meeting everyone from you to the, you know, the rest of the, the permies that we've mm -hmm. connected with just, and communities as well, it's just really hammered home that it, it's happening everywhere. Like mm -hmm. it's actually, there's just stuff happening yeah. everywhere you go. And even if it's in the most remote out there region of far North Queensland or, yeah. or, you know, down in the city of Sydney or something like it's really, yeah, it's really quite noticeable, mm -hmm. even in the last few years. You know, when I first started the band, you'd be lucky to have a handful of people in the crowd who knew what permaculture yeah, was. Right. Yeah. And now it's almost a household name yeah. or, or something like it is a household name. So yeah. people doing regenerative ag and syntropics and, yeah. and uh, you know, social permaculture or sociocracy or all these, all these grassroots movements seem to sort of be joining, mm. joining up and, and kind of connecting, yeah. which is really exciting. And so, it, yeah, it feels like... It feels like we can just sort of go home for a little bit and yeah. do a bit of that ourselves and just connect on a local scale. Yeah. But then with the marvels of modern technology, we can also, you know, still reach out to the world and occasionally travel as well. Yeah, yeah. Sounds amazing. Oh, love it. Yeah. And I think that's a really important thing, isn't it, to make sure that as we're wanting to be in this process of being practivists and bring about the changes to make sure that we don't forget ourselves in that process. Like, it's it's easy to do. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, caring, you know, that's all the zones, isn't it? That's bringing in the zone zero, zero yep. as well and, and, yep. and uh, nourishing that. Well, thank you for joining me today. Oh, it's been and, a pleasure. Um, so you've got, I'm going to pop in the links to all the things. So where, just maybe if anyone doesn't have a pen and paper or can't see the notes, where would people find 
you? Well, we're um, at formidablevegetable.com and on all of the streaming places. And if you want to listen to the music, Bandcamp's a great place because they actually pay artists. So that'll help support oh, us. Oh, yeah, great. And, and also you have Patreon. Yeah, we're on, on Patreon as well for with um, Grow Do It, which is mine and Brenna's permaculture education thing. But oh, it's mostly... We, and do you want to just talk a little bit about that? Because Grow Do It, tell us what that is. Yeah, so Grow Do It was... Uh, I mean, I started that before Formidable Vegetable. It was, um, it sort of turned into our label, which is hilarious because I've, I've never been on a label, but you just create one and then you've got a label. But uh, yeah, we've actually started using it to create teaching materials and resources for, for permies and teachers to, to teach these in, in different creative ways. And Brenna's an illustrator. So, you know, it's a really great combination mm -hmm. where I can use my music and Brenna's illustration to create these card games and posters and decks and games and things to, um, to, to teach permaculture to people of all ages and then yeah do the band stuff as well so yeah we, we're ticking that over and, yep. and ramping it up we're teaching our first pdc in wa next year very nice under grow do it and yep. yeah if people want to support that they can go to patreon slash grow do it thank you so much for joining me today it's been an absolute pleasure and i'm really looking forward to i'm not only going to come to the gig tonight here at crystal waters but heading following you down to brisbane as well tomorrow awesome. for the gig down there at food connect which well, will be amazing Thanks yes. for all you do as well, Morag. You're an absolute legend and we follow your stuff throughout the world and beyond and it's just amazing, you know, your ability to connect people and and bring it to the world. So, yeah, thank you as well. Well, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Sense Making in a Changing World. Check out the show notes below to find links to the resources mentioned in this episode. Also, too, this is where you'll find details of all of our permaculture courses, our permaculture YouTube, blog, and free masterclasses and permaculture film clubs. Make sure you signed up, too, to hear all of the news and updates. And come and join us at the Permaculture Education Institute to learn practical skills for designing and teaching permaculture and making a good livelihood while living a permaculture-inspired one-planet way of life. Take care, everyone. See you soon.